Hello and welcome to the Week 11 podcast for LWS 011 Journalism Law. I'm Peter Black. This week we are moving on to look at an area of intellectual property law known as copyright law, something that is very important uh, for journalists and the media industry more broadly. We'll begin very briefly by looking just at what is intellectual property before focusing on copyright and the various different steps you need to work through to decide whether there is a copyright issue or uh, problem in a particular scenario. So, but first, what do we mean by this term intellectual property? Now, it's a bit of a difficult question, but I've reproduced here a standard definition um, from one of the leading IP textbooks in the country written by McEwock, Stewart and Griffith, where they define intellectual property in this way. Broadly speaking, we can say that intellectual property is a generic term for the various rights or bundles of rights which the law accords for the protection of creative effort or, more especially, for the protection of economic investment in creative effort. And that's really what IP is all about. Now, it falls into a few different types of species of IP. We're going to be looking at copyright this week because it's the most relevant one for journalists and the media. But there are a range of other different uh, areas of intellectual property law, including trademarks, designs, patents, plant breeders' rights, and also circuit layouts. Now, the other one of those that's likely to be relevant, perhaps, for journalists is, is in some instances, trademarks, um, but uh, we don't have time, unfortunately, in this unit to spend uh, any time on that particular topic. There are also links to general uh, law from intellectual property, including passing off and also breach of confidence, which is something that we have considered uh, on at least two occasions so far throughout this semester. So let's begin with a brief introduction to the copyright system. And as is almost uh, always the case, we need to have a little bit of an understanding of some of the history to see how copyright law developed over the centuries. Its origins can be traced back to what is referred to as the stationer's monopoly. And this was the fact that back several centuries ago, the people who owned the printing presses had basic control over what was printed. They were the stationers and they had a monopoly over printed material. And that really gave the stationers a sense of ownership over that material. Now, what the Statute of Anne did, though, was begin to shift this away from the people that owned the printing press itself to those who actually created the material. And in particular, following the Statute of Anne, which was really the first document that came up with the concept of uh, copyright, uh, we began to see the law recognise creators. And initially it was just the printed word, but we began to see piecemeal development in this area of law to account for new purposes. And this happened in a series of copyright statutes in Great Britain in the 18th and 19th century, which were ultimately culminated uh, or consolidated in 1911 in the UK Copyright Act. Now, the UK Copyright Act is very much the basis for Australian copyright law, because in 1912, the Australian Parliament basically just adopted uh, in its entirety the UK Copyright Act. And so there's a lot of cases, particularly in the early years of copyright law, that definitely informed Australian copyright law as well. The modern origins of Australian copyright law come from the current Act, which is the Copyright Act of 1968. But since then, we have seen a great deal of change and growth in Australian copyright law, mainly as a result of consistent and ongoing changes in technology. Every time new technologies come along, it requires legislatures to rethink exactly what and how copyright law is going to respond to those changes in the technology. And this will become very evident as we move throughout the various different parts of the Copyright Act over the next hour or so. 
You can certainly read more about this history, and certainly if you are studying intellectual property uh, or copyright law in more detail, this history will be particularly relevant to you. The reason why, though, we saw this area of law emerge over the past few centuries and emerge purely as a creature of statute, there is no common law of copyright. It has its origins very much in legislation and in the statute books. The main reason as to why we saw this area of law emerge is that they were wanting to reward creators. And the rationale and motivation behind rewarding creators was to ensure creativity within the society itself, to encourage creativity, to encourage innovation. At the same time, what these laws try to do is do not provide or, or seek to so that they don't provide unreasonable limitations on the public access to information. And so that is the balance that lies very much at the heart of modern copyright law. On the one hand, it's trying to encourage creativity by providing an appropriate reward for creators, but at the same time, it's also wanting to ensure that the public has access to information, and perhaps more significantly for the purposes of media law as well, access to culture. And that balance goes to the heart of the Copyright Act, and indeed it goes to the very heart as to how copyright law works out in the sense that, as we will discover, copyright law grants certain rights to creators, but at the same time, it also provides for various defences or exceptions to those rights. And it is by or through those defences or exceptions that it ensures the public access to information while still providing sufficient reward for creators. Now, there are a few basic principles that we need to understand before we can begin to look at copyright law in a little bit more detail. The first is that copyright in property is intangible. That is to say, there is a distinction between the object itself and a separate copyright. Now, it's at this point in the lecture, if I were delivering this lecture face to face, that I would theatrically and dramatically hold up a book in the air and say that I own this book. That is to say, I own the object of the book. Uh, but someone else, namely the author and the publisher, owns the copyright in it. There is, therefore, a distinction in the sense that property in the chattel is owned by one person but the copyright is owned by another. So you own a book, but someone else will own the copyright in that book. You might own a DVD or a CD, but obviously someone else is going to own the copyright in that CD or DVD. There is that distinction between the object and the copyright. Now, the second basic principle we need to get our head around is known as the idea-expression dichotomy. This is important because copyright law does not protect ideas. It protects the expression of those ideas. And there's really two main reasons as to why this is so. The first is that it's virtually impossible to provide any legal protection for an idea itself. Because who had the idea first? How would you go about proving that or establishing that? So instead, what the law seeks to protect is the expression of that idea. Now, the second reason as to why we have at the heart of our copyright system what's known as the idea-expression dichotomy is the purpose or the notion that copyright law is not designed to monopolise everyday activity and that independent thought isn't stopped. Now, we see the idea-expression dichotomy uh, articulated in various international instruments, for example, Article 9.2 of TRIPS, uh, as well as in a series of cases. In terms of Article 9.2 of TRIPS, trade-related aspects of intellectual property systems, uh, copyright, it says that copyright protection shall extend to expressions and not to ideas, procedures, 
methods of operation or mathematical concepts. A uh, nice, succinct statement of what I'm referring to as the idea-expression dichotomy. In terms of these two cases, uh, let's have a look both at Zocola and Universal City Studios, as well as Bajent and Random House Group. Zocola deals with the book and movie Jaws, and Bajent and the Random House Group deals with the book uh, and uh, movie uh, of the Da Vinci Code. So, first, Zocola. Now, Universal Studios owned copyright in the film Jaws, the screenplay Jaws, and the novel Jaws. Now, Zocola made a film about man-eating sharks called Great White, and Universal sued Zocola for copyright infringement. And Zocola argued that there was no copyright in the general idea of a film about man-eating sharks. Uh, and indeed, the court agreed with that basic proposition. There is no copyright in the general idea of a film about man eating sharks. The level of abstraction there is way too broad, and of course, you can't copyright the idea. But while there was no copyright in the general idea of a film about man eating sharks, copyright did subsist in the combination of the principal situations, singular events, and basic characters. That is to say, the way that the idea of a film or a story about man-eating sharks was expressed through those principal situations, singular events, and basic characters was subject to copyright protection. And then there is the Da Vinci Code case. In that case, Michael Bajent and Richard Lee had sued publishers of Random House claiming that Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, appropriated the architecture of their book, The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, which was published in 1982 by the same publishing house. Now, ultimately, the court held here that there was no copyright infringement. They said that even if the central themes were copied, they are too general or of too low a level of abstraction to be capable of protection by copyright law, and that therefore there was no copyright infringement either by textual copying or non-textual copying of a substantial part of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail by means of copying the central themes. Now this is an interesting case for you to have a look at for a few different reasons. First of all, many of you or all of you have probably either read the Da Vinci Code or seen the movie The Da Vinci Code, so you'll be able to relate to what the case is talking about. Secondly, the judge does a very good job of summarising all the relevant law and authorities in relation to the idea-expression dichotomy and exactly what copyright does indeed subsist in. So in that respect, it's also quite a useful case to have a look at. The third reason is that the judge clearly had a little bit of fun when he was writing his judgment in this particular case uh, and chose to embed a hidden code in the case itself. Uh, and so if you are particularly inclined to enjoy hidden codes and the like, see if you can spot the hidden code in the Da Vinci Code case. All of this means is that you can get copyright in things like newspaper articles, novels, song lyrics, computer programs, paintings, drawings, photographs, screenplays, music films, and television and radio broadcasts. But as we'll discover, you won't generally get copyright in things like ideas or concepts, names or titles, or even a style of painting. What do you have to do, however, to get copyright? The short answer is nothing. In Australia, copyright protection is automatic. You don't have to apply to get copyright protection. You don't have to register to get copyright protection. If you're the creator of a work, you will automatically get the benefit of copyright protection. It is, however, worth noting that the requirements may be different in other parts of the world, such as in the United States. But in Australia, copyright protection is automatic. You don't have to apply uh, to get it registered um, or recognised. Moving then to copyright law itself. 
There's basic structure you need to follow when answering copyright questions, as well as the basic structure that we'll follow as we move through the material this week, are these five steps. The first thing you need to ask yourself is whether copyright subsists in something. And you have to answer this by looking at either part three or part four of the act. And that is because part three and part four of the act deal with different types of things. So part three of the act deals with works, literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works. Whereas part four deals with, and I swear this is true, subject matter other than works. That's the title that is given to it, a title that only a lawyer could come up with. And so subject matter other than works under part four of the act deals with sound recordings, films, television or sound broadcast, and published editions of works. So once you've then worked out where the copyright subsists in something, either under part three or part four, you then need to look at whether, or who rather, owns that copyright. And again, you either have to go under part three if you're dealing with the work, or part four if you're dealing with subject matter other than a work. You also need to check when looking at ownership of copyright, whether an assignment has taken place or whether a license has been granted. Once you've then worked out that copyright subsists in something and who owns copyright, you need to consider whether there has been an infringement or a threatened infringement of copyright before then going on in the fourth step to look at whether there are any excuses. Now this really is where the Copyright Act provides for this balance that I referred to earlier. Because once you have copyright subsisting in something and owned by someone and certain exclusive rights that go along with that, what the Act then says that in certain circumstances you people are able to make copies of that work or subject matter other than works. Uh, and that's where the balance is achieved and that's where we need to look at these excuses, specifically whether there is a fair dealing for one of the purposes provided for in the Act. And of course, the last step uh, then requires you to consider whether there are any remedies available. So let's then move to the first of these questions. Does copyright subsist? And again, as I've said, we need to go under part three or part four. When we're looking at part three, we're dealing with works. And in that particular situation, the conditions set out in section 32 of the Act need to be satisfied. Whereas if we're dealing with subject matter other than works, that is, we're dealing with sound recordings, films, television or radio broadcast or published editions of works, we need to look at the provisions in part four of the Act. And importantly, it is significant to realise and appreciate that where copyright subsists in a work or other subject matter, it does so automatically. You do not need to register copyright. Copyright attaches to something automatically. And that makes it a little bit different from some other areas of intellectual property, such as trademark law or patent law, where you need to either register or apply to get the benefit of that form of intellectual property protection. But when you're dealing with copyright law, copyright subsists in a work or other subject matter automatically. You do not need to apply to have it registered. So let's have a look at subsistence of copyright with respect to part three. The copyright to subsist in a work under part three of the Copyright Act the following elements must be satisfied. It must be original, it must be expressed in a material form, it must be a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work, and it must have a connection with Australia. Considering each of these elements then in turn. When we're talking about originality, it's not as though it has to be the first time anyone had that particular idea. When we're talking about originality for the purposes of part three of the Copyright Act, all it requires is that it originates from the author. It is original work if it originates from the author. 
in the sense that it is the result of his or her skill, labour or judgement, and is not copied from another author. A case that illustrates this proposition is University of London Press and University Tutorial Press. Here, a condition of appointment for examiners was that copyright in the papers belonged to the university. The university subsequently assigned copyright to the plaintiff publisher. The defendant publisher then published exams with answers and comments, and the plaintiff publisher sued for infringement of copyright. And the question, or at least one of the questions for the court, was whether copyright could subsist in these exam papers as original literary works. And the court held that indeed it could. Now you as law students hopefully know how unoriginal most exam papers are and how dull and boring most exam papers are to both read and to write. Uh, that does not mean though of course that copyright uh, cannot or does not subsist in them. And so here the court held that copyright subsisted in the papers as original, original literary works. Originality did not require that the work be original or inventive, as long as there was originality in the expression of the idea, in the sense that it was the result of the author's skill, labour or judgement, and was not copied from another author. So it's quite a low bar, quite a low threshold, uh, in order for something to be considered original for the purposes of Part 3 of the Copyright Act. The next element is that it must be expressed in a material form. This is again uh, a requirement because of the idea expression dichotomy. Copyright law does not express the does not protect the idea, it protects the expression of that idea. And so an idea becomes a work when it is first reduced to writing or to some other material form. Now, the Act defines writing to mean a mode of representing or reproducing words, figures or symbols in a visible form. And, of course, written has a corresponding meaning. Writing's quite easy. In terms of material form, though, the Act says that in relation to a work or an adaptation of a work, it includes any form, whether visible or not, of storage of the work or adaptation or a substantial part of the work or adaptation, whether or not the work or adaptation or a substantial part of the work or, or adaptation can be reproduced. The third element under Part 3 is that it must be a literary, musical, dramatic or artistic work. So let's have a look at each of those then. So first of all, in a literary work. Very broad definition of what constitutes a literary work comes from Section 10 of the Act. A literary work includes a table or compilation expressed in words, figures or symbols, whether or not in a visible form, and a computer program or compilation of computer programs. So with respect to that definition, it's worth noting First of all, that a literary work does not need to be literature in order for it to be considered a literary work. Uh, and second of all, it's worth noting that computer programs are protected as literary works under the Copyright Act. And the reason for this, of course, is because computer programs are written in code. That is, they are written in letters and numbers, therefore literary work. And a literary work is a work which is expressed in print or writing, irrespective of whether the quality or style is high. That is to say, it certainly does not need to be considered a great work of literature in order for it to be considered a literary work. Uh, and indeed, some very basic things have been held to be literary works, such as football pool coupons, a racing program, chronological lists of football matches, Lists of bingo numbers, accounting forms, all very dry, <laughs> dull things have been held to be literary works. Now, one question which has arisen in this space in the context of media law relates to electronic programming guides and whether these electronic programming guides or EPGs can be considered as literary works. This appeared or came up before the court in a case known as ICE-TV. Um, 
Now, this was a case that really asked whether the process of preparing and publishing the ICE TV Electronic Programming Guide infringed Channel 9's copyright in its weekly TV schedule. So basically, is there copyright in the TV schedule that such and such a program is going to be on at 7 p.m., that the news is going to be on at 6 p.m., and whatever it may be. That was the basic issue before the court in this litigation. Now, in the facts of this case, ICE TV used information from an earlier ICE guide to predict the future scheduled program, which was then checked against publicly available guides. Now, what happened in that particular case was that ICE TV had people sit down and basically watch Channel 9 and they noticed certain patterns about their programming. So, for example, that at 6 o'clock, it's the news. At 6.30, it's a current affair. At 7 o'clock, uh, it's whatever crap it is. Uh, <laughs> um, and once they'd worked out that basic schedule, they then cross-referenced it against Nine's publicly available programming guide. Now, Channel 9's guide, though, was prepared by a number of its staff and the information was extracted in a number of different formats from its database. This weekly schedule, which was a compilation, was then sent to an aggregator who extracted that information and assembled it alongside similar information from other free-to-air networks. They then published its guide online and in print media. Now, the ICE guide, the ICE TV guide, uh, was then compared uh, against this, and where necessary, it was uh, adjusted. Now, Channel 9 was arguing that ICE TV had infringed its copyright by taking that part of the time and the title information in Channel 9's guide and including it in the ICE TV guide, which Channel 9 at least argued amounted to a reproduction in a material form of a substantial part of the copyrighted work, namely Nine's weekly television schedule. Now, Ice TV, of course, denied that it had reproduced in a material form a substantial part of Channel 9's weekly schedule, uh, and uh, the case proceeded on that uh, basis. Now, in this situation, both, or in this case rather, both the primary judge and the full court of the federal court uh, approached the question of whether ICE TV had reproduced a substantial part of Channel 9's schedule by identifying the skill and labour which was expended to create Channel 9's schedule and then asked whether ICE TV had indeed taken 9's skill and labour. Now, while both the primary judge and the full court of the federal court followed that basic process, they arrived at opposite conclusions. The primary judge found that the skill and labour in the time and title was not relevant and that consequently there was no reproduction in a substantial part. The full court of the Federal Court, however, considered that the preparatory work by nine staff to identify the time and title was relevant skill and labour and that it was a reproduction uh, of a substantial part. Now, the High Court, though, confirmed the long-standing principle that copyright cannot protect facts or information. Rather, it protects the particular form of expression of the information, that is, the words, the figures, the symbols in which the information is expressed, including both the selection and the arrangement of that information. And by restating that, the High Court found that the underlying purpose of Nine's preparatory work was performed to determine when a program was to be shown at a particular time so as to attract viewers and therefore command commercial revenue. That process was not considered as skill and labour for copyright protection. The High Court held that the time and title information alone lacked the creative spark to be cloaked with copyright protection. Very significant decision in relation to uh, subsistence of copyright. Now, the case itself is a little bit uh, confused because of some concessions that were made by the parties uh, early on. So the main point that you need to take uh, away from it was that uh, ultimately 
um, the court reaffirmed the principle that copyright cannot protect facts or information. Rather, it protects the particular form of expression of the information, including the selection and arrangement of that information. Another aspect to consider with respect to literary works is that copyright does not normally subsist in titles and names. Two cases that illustrate this point. First of all, there's the Exxon case. The oil company adopted the name Exxon after considerable research and expense. The defendant company, with no connection, then adopted the name Exxon sought an injunction. The court ultimately concluded, concluded that although the name was original, that is the name of Exxon was original, it was not sub sufficiently substantial for copyright to subsist in the name, in those five letters. Of course, that could be protected under trademark law, just not under copyright law. Another case that illustrates this point is Francis Day and Hunter and 20th Century Fox. There, Francis Day and Hunter had released a song titled The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo. Twenty years later, 20th Century Fox put out a movie by the same title, but it had no other connection to the song. Francis Day and Hunter sued for copyright infringement. The court held there that a name alone cannot possess copyright unless it is sufficiently original and distinctive. Uh, and the court did not think very highly of that title uh, on either the basis of originality or distinctiveness. The court said that to break the bank is a hackneyed expression and that Monte Carlo is or was the most obvious place at which that achievement or accident might take place. Now, one area where this becomes quite significant as to whether copyright subsists in titles and names is that with respect to newspaper headlines, as to whether copyright can subsist in newspaper headlines. Now, this is increasingly important in the digital era, largely because we now have so many websites and platforms that make money in effect by aggregating newspaper or news headlines from the internet, running their advertisements alongside those headlines from other sources, uh, and that a number of media organisations have been upset with that practice, including, of course, uh, News Limited and Rupert Murdoch. And we actually have two conflicting decisions here as to whether copyright can and does subsist in newspaper headlines. We have the Australian case of Fairfax Media, as well as the British case of Newspaper Licensing Agency and Meltwater Holdings. The Australian case ultimately held that copyright did not subsist in newspaper headlines, whereas the British case held that it did. As I've said, because of the significance of headlines and links in the digital age and the monetization of online aggregators surrounding links, it is likely that we will continue to see uh, more litigation in this particular area. And one thing that we will hopefully talk about in class is as to whether these newspaper headlines uh, do indeed attract copyright. A related question, of course, and one that is close to my heart as an obsessive compulsive Twitterer, uh, is whether a tweet is substantial enough for copyright to subsist in it. Remembering a tweet is only 140 characters. And while some might be substantial and original, uh, there's no doubt that a great deal of tweets uh, would not come anywhere close to meeting those requirements. Again, that will hopefully be something we can discuss in class. Another category under part three is dramatic works. The definition of a dramatic work under section 10 is that it includes a choreographic show or other dumb show. A dumb show in this context is not a bad show. Uh, a dumb show is a mime show, uh, as well as a scenario or script for a film, but it does not include a film as distinct from the scenario or script for a film. And that is because copyright in the film itself, in the finished product, is the subject of a separate copyright under part four of the Copyright Act. 
Now, the essential character of a dramatic work is that it is intended to be represented or performed in some way, for example, by acting or by dancing. And significantly, a dramatic work must not only be intended to be performed, it must also be able to be performed. So disparate elements without sufficient unity do not amount to a dramatic work. And this was illustrated in the case of Green and Broadcasting Corporation of New Zealand. There's also the question as to whether public events can be considered as dramatic works. Uh, and Nine Network uh, and the ABC is a case that dealt with New Year's Eve fireworks as to whether there was copyright in those fireworks. The next category under part three is musical works. And the term musical work is not defined. Uh, the adjective musical, though, refers to the method of production and not to any artistic or aesthetic qualities which the work should possess. And that's probably for the best. The last thing you want is a stuffy elderly judge working out what is music and what is not. And then the last category of works under part three of the Copyright Act are artistic works. And again, the definition from section 10 provides that an artistic work includes a painting, sculpture, drawing, engraving, or photograph, whether the work is of artistic quality or not, a building or a model of a building, whether the building or model is of artistic quality or not, uh, and a work of artistic craftsmanship, which neither of the last two preceding paragraphs applies. It does not, however, include a circuit layout within the meaning of the circuit layout. Acts. The final element then, when we're looking at to see whether copyright subsists in something under part three of the Copyright Act, is that there must be a connection with Australia, and it's a slightly different test depending upon whether we are talking about an unpublished work or a published work. For an unpublished work, the author must be a qualified person at the time it was made. And a qualified person is defined to be an Australian citizen, an Australian protected person, or a person resident in Australia. For published works, however, the publication must have first taken place in Australia, or the author must be a qualified person when it was first published. And again, there's the same definition of a qualified person under Section 32.4 of the Copyright Act. A work is deemed to have been published if reproductions have been supplied to the public. So that then are the processes or the steps you need to go through to work out whether copyright subsists in something under part three of the Copyright Act. It needs to be original, it needs to be in a material form, it must be a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work, and there must be a connection with Australia. We can then turn to part four, subject matter other than works. And these are more recent categories of subject matter that were included or introduced in the 1968 Copyright Act in order to protect the entrepreneurial investment associated with these new technologies. And the rights that are given to these new technologies under part four of the Copyright Act are given to the makers of certain types of material. And it is to protect the investment of resources in the production of media and content. The consequence of this is that there is no requirement of authorship or originality when we are talking about a subject matter other than works. We are really just talking about whether it is indeed uh, one of those various different types of new technologies that are protected under part four of the Copyright Act. So the various things that are protected under part four of the Copyright Act are sound recordings, films, television and sound broadcasts, as well as published editions of works. And importantly, copyright in such subject matter under part four is in addition to and independent of any copyright subsisting in the work under part three. That is to say that it's not a matter of copyright being protected in either part three 
or in either part four, copyright, you can have copyright uh, vest under both part three and under part four of the Copyright Act. And a good example of that comes from those earliest cases that we looked at in terms of JAWS and the Da Vinci Code. Because there you would have copyright in both the original book as well as the as the original book as a literary work, as well as the screenplay as a dramatic work, and then also, under part four, the finished product, the film. So copyright in sub, sub, such subject matter is in addition to and independent of any copyright subsisting in the work under part three. Another example of that might be in relation to a popular song. You would have copyright in the lyrics as a literary work under part three. You would have copyright in the melody or the music as a musical work under part three. And then you would also have copyright in the finished sound recording, that is the MP3 or the CD, or whatever it may be, the means of distribution, as a sound recording under part four of the Copyright Act. The first category under part four is television and sound broadcasts. Now, the definition of broadcast comes from section 10. Uh, television broadcast basically means the TV broadcast itself together with any sounds broadcast for reception along with those images. The sound broadcast basically covers a radio broadcast uh, and broadcast itself means a communication to the public delivered by a broadcasting service within the meaning of the Broadcasting Services Act. And that is something that we will, of course, be looking at in more detail in future weeks. Now, one key aspect of the concept of broadcasting is that it must be to the public. Another important point to appreciate is that there is no need for copyright in the underlying material. That is to say, it's not as though the underlying material has to be protected under Part 3 in order for it to be protected as a television or a sound broadcast under Part 4. Probably the best example of this is the fact that there is no underlying copyright in a sports match under Part 3. It's not considered a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work. But the maker of the TV or sound broadcast still gets the right to that broadcast. A relevant case here is that of Phonographic Performance Company of Australia Limited and Commercial Radio of Australia Limited. And the issue that was at play in that particular case was whether the online streaming of a radio program constituted a sound broadcast for the purposes of both the Broadcasting Services Act and the Copyright Act. The reason as to why this was an issue was as to whether the makers of these sound broadcasts had to pay two separate royalty fees, that is royalties for the radio broadcast as well as a royalty for the online streaming or whether the online streaming could be subsumed into the radio or sound broadcast and that therefore only one set of royalty fees needed to be paid. Now ultimately the full court of the federal court held in this case that the online streaming or the internet streaming of the radio was not a sound broadcast for these purposes uh, and therefore Radio stations, if they wished to also broadcast their programming online, needed to pay additional royalty fees. This was a significant copyright decision. Uh, for, no, for no other reason than it gives rights holders a, another revenue stream. Of course, it also means higher operating costs for the broadcasters. Special leave was sought to the High Court, uh, but it was rejected. Part three, then, to go back to part three, then, dealing with ownership. So the first step that we looked at was whether copyright subsists in something. The next step now is to look at ownership. Who owns copyright in something that subsists either under part three of the Copyright Act or under part four of the Copyright Act? This is the second step. And once again, we need to consider this in the context, first of all, of part three, and then in the context of part four. So dealing with part three and the ownership of copyright in works. 
Now, the basic rule here is that the creator, which is referred in the 1968 Act as the author, is the first owner of copyright. Now, the Act gives no general definition of author, but it is interpreted as the creator of the work from whom the form of expression originates. It does, however, tell us who the author of a photograph is under Section 10, and it provides that the author of a photograph is the taker of the photograph. That is, the person that takes the photograph owns the copyright in the photograph, not the people that are the subjects of the photograph. But the basic rule, nonetheless, is that the author is the first owner of copyright. There are, however, three exceptions to this basic rule. Works produced in the course of employment, journalists, and then commissioned artistic works. It's also worth noting that ownership of copyright can always be modified by contract. Let's, however, uh, look first at this issue of joint ownership. Now, joint ownership is defined in Section 10 of the Act, and it's defined to mean a work that has been produced by the collaboration of two or more authors and in which the contribution of each author is not separate from the contribution of the other authors or the contributions of the other authors. Now, the significance of this definition is that it does not mean that all jointly produced works will, re will result in joint authorship. Joint authorship will not apply where each author supplies a distinct part. So, for example, if we're talking about a song, one person may have written the lyrics, one person may have written the music. That's not a case of joint authorship. The person who wrote the lyrics gets the copyright in the literary work, and the person that writes the music gets the copyright in the musical work. Similarly, you might have multiple authors contribute to a book. It may well be that you are able to identify that, or, that chapters 1 to 4 were written by one author, in which case they own the copyright in those chapters, and that the authors 5 through 8 were written by another author, in which case they would own the copyright in those chapters. So joint authorship um, does not apply where each author supplies a distinct part. Significantly, but also logically, because of the idea expression dichotomy, supplying ideas and supplying ideas only doesn't give rise to joint authorship. So where a person communicates an idea to an author and the author clothes the idea in the form of an article or articles, the copyright is uh, in the author of that article. And so in Donahue and Allied newspapers, what they were dealing with there was a situation whereby a jockey was recounting the story of his life to a journalist. The journalist was the one that wrote the articles and ultimately sought to publish a book on the basis of the jockey's life. The jockey claimed that he was entitled to joint authorship. The court rejected that argument because he had only contributed the ideas. The expression had been done by the journalist. Now, joint authors take ownership as tenants in common. That means that each has titled to sue and indeed can sue each other. The first exception, though, to the general rule that the author is the first owner of copyright is that it works produced in the course of employment. Now, under a contract of employment, the employer owns copyright of works produced in the course of employment. And the employee must be working under a contract of service as distinguished from a contract for services. And the test here is whether on the one hand the employee is employed as part of the business and his work is an integral part of the business, whether his work is not integrated into the business but is only an accessory to it, or the work is done by him in business on his own account. Now, a case that illustrates this is Beloff and Prestrom. In that particular case, the plaintiff was a political correspondent of the London Observer. He issued a politically sensitive internal memo to the editor and senior staff about the Prime Minister. It was published in full by another publication, The Private Eye, and the plaintiff sued for infringement of copyright. It was held that as the plaintiff was employed under a contract of service, the copyright in the memo was vested in the owners of the London Observer and not in the plaintiff, and therefore he was not able 
uh, to be successful uh, in suing for infringement of copyright. Consultancies are a little bit different. A person employed as a consultant retains copyright in the work he or she produces subject to contrary express agreement. The next exception to the general rule is that of journalists. Now, journalists are the owners of copyright with respect to two limited rights. First of all, the reproduction of the work for the purposes of inclusion in a book and then reproduction of the work in the form of a hard copy facsimile made from a paper edition of an issue of the newspaper. The proprietor of the newspaper or magazine is the owner of the copyright for any other purpose. Now, this reproduction of the work in the form of a hard copy facsimile made from a paper edition of an issue of the newspaper was a right that journalists won for the purposes of reproduction in press clipping services. This was illustrated in the case of de Garris and Neville Jeffress Pidler, Proprietary Limited. Now, de Garris was a university lecturer and an occasional contributor, contributor to the West Australian. He was not, however, an employee. Moore, the second plaintiff, was employed by the Sydney Morning Herald. The defendant operated a press clipping service. De Garris and Moore sued the defendant for breach of copyright in respect of pieces written for their respective newspapers, which the defendant had subsequently photocopied and distributed to the client. Now, under pre-1988 legislation, the publisher only owned rights to make and distribute photocopies insofar as they related to publication in a newspaper. Accordingly, Jeffress infringed Moore's rights to reproduce in a material form, but not de Garris. It is worth noting now that this right only exists to sue if photocopies are made. So press services can negotiate exclusively with the publisher to make and communicate electronic copies. So this hard copy facsimile right that was uh, one is somewhat limited. The third exception to the general rule here is that of commissioned artistic works. So in the following cases, the person who commissioned the work owns the copyright. The taking of a photograph for a private or a domestic purpose, that is a portrait of family members, children or a wedding party, the painting or drawing of a portrait and the making of an engraving. Copyright in all other commissioned works generally vests in the author. And of course, as I've said for copyright can always be modified by agreement. Ownership then of subject matter other than works under part four, this is a little bit simpler because it is usually granted to the maker. So for sound recordings, it's granted to the maker of the record, that is usually the recording company, um, the person who owned the record at that time. For films, the maker, of the film is the producer, that is the person who organises and pays for the film. For television and sound broadcasts, it's granted to the maker of the broadcast, and a broadcast is taken to be made by the person who provided the broadcasting service by which the broadcast was delivered. And published editions of works are granted to the publisher. One thing you always need to check when you are dealing with ownership is whether there have been any assignments or licenses. So copyright is, a, is personal property as we have seen and is transmissible by assignment, by will and by devolution by operation of law. You can assign or license all copyright or specific rights and you can limit it to specific jurisdictions. So for example, APRA takes performance rights in all present and future music. We'll look at assignments and then we'll look at licenses. An assignment is a transfer of ownership of copyright. This allows the recipient of that assignment to do anything in the copyright, including license, assign and sue for infringement. The assignor retains no special rights to the work and can be sued for copyright infringement. So if you assign your copyrighted work to someone else, you can ultimately potentially be sued for copyright infringement if you then seek to use or make a copy of that work that you have assigned. You retain no special rights to the work. 
An assignment must be in writing, it may be total or partial, and it may be future. This means that copyright will come into existence at a future time or on happening a future event, with copyright vesting in the assignee when the work comes into existence. For example, copyright in a yet unwritten book. Licenses then. A license is a permission to deal with the copyright subject matter for certain purposes. Now, an exclusive license is a license in writing, signed by or on behalf of the owner or prospective owner of copyright, authorising the licensee to the exclusion of all other persons to do an act that the owner of the copyright would, but for the licence, have the exclusive right to do. Of course, it doesn't have to be an exclusive licence. You can have non-exclusive licences, but if it is an exclusive licence, it must be in writing in accordance with those requirements set out in Section 10. It is worth noting that the Copyright Act also contains statutory licences. And a future of these schemes is that although prior permission to do the acts is not needed, arrangements must be put in place for the copyright owner receives equitable remuneration or is otherwise compensated for the exercise of his or her rights. Now, licenses do not need to be express or explicit. Licenses can be implied from the circumstances. An example is that a newspaper editor has an implied license to publish letters to the editor. When material is uploaded to the web, what is there an implied license associated with that? An implied license to download, perhaps. I think that would be quite uh, an extreme interpretation, although one that perhaps many high school students or other uh, young people may uh, think indeed exists. But there would at least be a license to cache the material for local viewing. That is to say that for you to be able to view any web page on the internet, you need to be able to make a temporary copy of that website on your computer or on that other, in order to be able to read it. So what that means is that simply placing any material online means that you are at least giving an implied license for people to be able to view that material. That is, at least to make a temporary copy on their device for local viewing. Now, in terms of these statutory licensing schemes, there are uh, some instances of compulsory licensing. Now, with these statutory licensing schemes, it is usually an infringement to exercise any of the copyright owner's exclusive rights without having first obtained the owner's permission or license to do so, or to authorise anyone else to infringe those rights. These statutory licenses, however, operate so that it is not an infringement of copyright to use the copyright material in a way that involves an exercise of the exclusive rights without having first obtained permission to do so. A feature of these schemes is that although permission to do the acts is not needed, as we have seen, arrangements must be put in place so that the copyright owner receives equitable remuneration or is otherwise compensated for the exercise of his or her rights. There's a few different compulsory licensing schemes that are provided for within the Copyright Act. Part 5b, for example, deals with reproducing material for schools and universities. Part 5a deals with audiovisual rights. And Part 5c deals with retransmission of works, sound recordings and films included in free-to-air broadcasts. There was also compulsory licensing for musical works. That is to say, you are able to make a sound recording of musical lyrics without permission of the copyright owner, but you must pay a statutory license fee. The music must also have already been recorded in Australia. There is no such right in relation to the sound recording. That is to say that sampling is not permissible. It does not extend to use in films. And record-making rights are mechanical rights of musical works. This compulsory licensing scheme for musical works is administered by the Australasian Mechanical Copyright Owner Society, known as AMCOS. But in the absence of this a compulsory licensing scheme, generally you need to get permission to use someone else's copyrighted work. Uh, and the Australian Copyright Council has some good practical information on how you go about obtaining that permission. 
The third step then is infringement. So the first step was subsistence. That is, does copyright subsist in something? The second step was ownership. Once copyright subsists in something, who owns the copyright? The third step, as I've said, is that of infringement. There are a few different aspects to infringement. We have to consider direct infringement, authorization of infringement, as well as indirect infringement. Direct infringement is starting with part three. It is an infringement of copyright to do or authorize any of the exclusive rights comprised in copyright without the permission of the copyright owner. So that is the scheme that the Copyright Act puts in place. It basically says that if you own the copyright in something, certain exclusive rights are attached to that, things that only you are able to do. If someone else does one of those exclusive rights, they have infringed your copyright. That's the way that the Act operates. Now, the exclusive rights are set out in Section 31.1. Now, for literary, dramatic and musical works, the exclusive rights are to reproduce the work in a material form, to publish the work, to perform the work in public, to communicate the work to the public, and to make an adaptation of the work. For an artistic work, the exclusive rights are to reproduce the work in a material form, to publish the work, and to communicate the work to the public. Now, when we're talking about an infringement under Part 3, the infringing act did not be done in relation to the whole of the work or other subject matter. It is sufficient if it is done in relation to a substantial part of the work. And substantial is a question of fact to be determined in the circumstances. It requires a consideration of the quality of the work taken in relation to the work as a whole, rather than just a question of quantity. Now, I'd encourage you then to click on the link of EMI Songs, Australia Proprietary Limited, and Larrikin Music that deals with the old folk song, Cookaburra Sits on the Old Gum Tree, and the Men at Work classic, um, Down Under, to get an idea uh, of uh, how this substantial requirement operates, and that it's not just a matter of quantity, it very much requires this consideration of the quality of the work taken in relation to the work as a whole. So, one of these exclusive rights, then, is to reproduce the work in a material form. Now, reproduction in this context means copying and does not include cases where the author or compiler produces a substantially similar result by independent work without copying. Now, the notion of reproduction in this context involves two elements, objective similarity and causal connection. Objective similarity means that there must be a sufficient degree of objective similarity between the plaintiff's and the defendant's work. That is, the defendant must have produced a work which closely resembles the plaintiff's. And then causal connection, the defendant's work must be derived directly or indirectly from the plaintiff's copyright work. That is to say, there must be some causal connection between the two works. What this means, of course, is that subconscious copying is sufficient if there is evidence of copying. Another exclusive right is to publish the work. Publish means to make available to the public in Australia something which has not previously been made available. The next one is to perform the work in public. There is an exclusive right to perform the work in public and a performance of the work is given to members of the public um, and it would be considered a performance in public in that context unless it is shown to be domestic in character. And these series of cases here illustrate what a low bar it is in order for it to be considered a performance of the work in public. So in APRA and Canterbury Bankstown League Club, um, a cover band performing songs in the Leagues Club was considered to be a performance in public. 
in APRA and Tolbush. Uh, radios in a shop were considered to be performance of a work in public. In APRA and Commonwealth Bank of Australia, a promotional video that was shown to a handful of employees at the Commonwealth Bank was shown to be the, a performance of the work in public. And in Rank Film Productions and Dude, uh, the in-house video system uh, for motels and hotels was considered to be a performance of the work in public. The next exclusive right is the right to communicate to the public. This is a wide right that is defined to mean make available online or electronically transmit, whether over a path or a combination of paths provided by a material substance or otherwise a work or other subject matter. Communication in this context, other than the broadcast, is taken to have been made by the person responsible for determining the content, content of the broadcast. And obviously this wide communication right that replaces the old broadcasting right includes making available copyright material online by, for example, uploading material onto the internet. The next exclusive right is to make an adaptation of the work. Adaptation includes the dramatization of a non-dramatic literary work, a translation, a pictorial version of a literary work, or an arrangement of a musical work. And then the last one uh, in this under part three is the exclusive right to enter into a commercial rental agreement, but this is limited to a sound recording, a literary, musical, or dramatic work reproduced in a sound recording, or a computer program. Turning then to part four, now direct infringement under part four is a much more restricted concept than that in relation to works under part three of the Copyright Act. So for sound recordings, the exclusive rights are to make a copy of the recording, cause the sound recording to be heard in public, communicate the record to the public, and enter into commercial rental agreements. And copy in this context means a record embodying a sound recording. The consequence or significance of that is that making a sound-alike version of a popular song, such as a cover version, will not infringe copyright in the sound recording, although it may, of course, infringe copyright in the underlying works, namely the lyrics and the music. For a film, the exclusive rights are to make a copy of the film, to cause the film to be seen or heard in public, and then to communicate the film to the public. And again, a case that's relevant there uh, is uh, Zocola and Universal uh, Studios. In this particular case, if you recall the facts, the court held that Zocola had not infringed copyright in the film as there was no copy of the visual images made. For television and sound broadcasts, the exclusive rights are to make a film of a television broadcast, to make a sound recording of a broadcast, or to rebroadcast or communicate to the public. The panel case is relevant here. You may remember the old TV show on Channel 10 called The Panel. In many ways, it was a predecessor to shows like The Project. It just involved a group of panellists or guests sitting around a table or a panel uh, talking about the news of the week. Uh, and they frequently showed clips, uh, using those clips as the basis to riff or to make jokes or whatever it may be. So Channel 10 showed The Panel. Uh, broadcast clips taken from other networks and Nine sued them, claiming um, it's infringed this right to broadcast. Uh, the full federal court held that any unauthorised rebroadcasting of a broadcast would be an infringement, subject to any defence. This was appealed to the High Court. Now, the High Court here held that copyright is only infringed if you rebroadcast the programme or a substantial part of the broad program. Otherwise, copyright or otherwise broadcast makers would get much more protection than other copyright owners. 
And then the last exclusive right uh, relates to published editions of works, and there's the exclusive right to make a facsimile copy of a published edition of one or more literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works. Now, the next category of infringement here relates to authorization of infringement. And Section 36 of the Copyright Act provides a copyright is also infringed when a person authorizes the doing of any act comprised of copyright without the license of the owner. And authorization means to sanction, approve, or countenance. And this comes from the case of University of New South Wales and Morehouse and Angus and Robinson Publishers Proprietary Limited. So what was going on in that case was that a student at the University of New South Wales had made two copies of a 10-page story by Morehouse at the photocopying machine in the library. No attempt was made to supervise the copiers to ensure that they were not being used to infringe copyright. Proceedings were taken by the author and the publisher against the university, saying that they had authorised an infringement of copyright. It was held that the university had indeed authorised the infringement of copyright. The university provided the books and the machines and failed to take adequate steps to warn about infringement. That is to say that they had sanctioned, approved or countenanced the infringement of copyright. Now, when you're arguing these cases, it must also be uh, established or at least accepted on the pleadings that an act of infringement has indeed taken place. And there must also be some connection between the authoriser and the infringer. That is to say, the authoriser must have some form of control over the infringer or provide the materials used in the infringement. And this was lacking in the case of RCA Corporation and John Fairfax. In that case, a journalist published articles on the possibility of using private recordings of records as an alternative to buying records. Basically, you, the article was saying you can record this music off the radio. The plaintiff claimed that this article authorised the infringement of copyright. The court rejected this argument, said that no, there was no authorization as there was no control between the newspaper and the taper. The article did not sanction, approve or countenance the taping as well. The court said that it was a factual report, not an invitation or an incitement to infringe. Now, when determining the issue of authorization today, the following matters need to be taken into account. The extent of the person's power to prevent the doing of the act concerned the nature of any relationship existing between the person and the persons who did the act concerned, and whether the person took any reasonable steps to prevent or avoid the doing of the act, including whether the person complied with any relevant industry code of codes of practice. Now, the issue of authorization of copyright infringement has become quite contested in recent years as a result of advances in digital technology, which have made copying easier, as well as making it easier for people to obtain access to material that can then be copied. <clears throat> and so we have seen a series of cases in both the United States as well as Australia dealing with the issue of authorization of copyright infringement in the online environment. The three main Australian cases are Universal Music, known as the Kazar case, the Cooper case, and then the IINet case. First one then was Kazar case, which was Universal Music Australia and Sharman License Holdings. In that particular case, Sharman ran a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing platform of sound recordings known as Kazar. Uh, Kazar was sued for authorizing copyright infringement uh, and the court agreed. The court said in that case that even though the Kazar system had a number of technological controls, they were insufficient to overcome a finding of liability for copyright infringement by authorization. In particular, in that case, the court thought it was particularly relevant that the warnings contained on the Kazar website and the end user license agreement prohibiting infringing copyright were ineffective to pre prevent such conduct, 
and Kazar was well aware that their system was being utilised for sharing copyright files. The Kazar did not implement any technological measures, such as keyword and file filtering, which could have curtailed the sharing of copyright files, and that Kazar actively encouraged misconduct by including exhortations such as join the revolution to increase the incidence of infringing file sharing. So that was Kazar. In Cooper, Cooper maintained a website known as mp3sforfree.com. Now, this website provided an organized directory of hyperlinks to websites that had downloads of infringing copies of music. The website in Cooper did not actually store the infringing MP3s, but it provided a range of different types of hyperlinks to these MP3s for free. The court held that Cooper had indeed authorised the infringement of copyright. They said that Cooper had the capacity to remove hyperlinks or structure the website in such a way that the operators of remote websites could not automatically add hyperlinks without some supervision. And then there was the really significant case of Roadshow Films, Proprietary Limited and IINet. This was significant because up until this particular point, the entertainment industry had been trying to sue websites and platforms for authorising copyright infringement. This was the first time they sought to go after an ISP itself. And namely, they went after IINet. So what was going on then in this case? Basically, back in 2008, 34 film companies commenced proceedings in the federal court against INET that at the time was Australia's third largest internet service provider. The film companies alleged that INET had authorised the copyright infringement of its users and was therefore liable for infringement under Australian copyright law. By way of background, the film company's representative, the Australian Federation Against Copyright Theft, known as AFACT, had conducted investigations into online copyright infringement. Through its investigations into a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network known as BitTorrent, AFACT found evidence that INET users were infringing the copyright in films belonging to the film companies. From July 2008, AFACT sent notices to INET attaching information demonstrating that INET users were using BitTorrent to infringe the film company's copyright. Those notices, and this turned out to be significant, however, did not detail AFACT's methodology from infringing the film company's copyright by warning, suspending or terminating the um, internet service of those uh, users. So. It didn't detail AFEX methodology, um, but it did indeed demand um, that INET prevent its users from infringing the film company's copyright by warning, suspending or terminating the internet service of those users. INET declined to take any action in response to AFEX notices, maintaining that while it did not endorse or improve of the copyright infringements, it was not INET's business to take action on the basis of the allegations. Now, this went all the way up to the High Court, and ultimately the High Court held that INET was not liable for authorising the copyright infringement of its users. The Court held that INET had no direct technical power to prevent its users from using the BitTorrent system. INET's only power was indirect. Under its customer agreement, it could terminate accounts if the internet service had been used to infringe another person's rights or for illegal um, purposes. The court was not ultimately persuaded that INET was required to exercise that power to terminate those uh, accounts. And indeed, the court quite correctly and obviously noted that uh, INET's power to prevent copyright infringement in the situation was limited because of the ease with which a customer could potentially migrate from one service to another service provider. Further, AFAC's notices to INET did not fully disclose its methodology, and the court noted that reliance on these incomplete notices must be balanced against INET's legal risk if it wrongfully terminated a customer's internet service. And so against all of this, the Kai Court ultimately held um, that it was not unreasonable for IINet not to act on AFAC's allegations. 
INET did not authorize the copyright infringement of its users, and accordingly, the appeal was dismissed. Now, following this decision, of course, there has been a great deal of push from the entertainment industry and AFACT for some legislative reform in this particular area to ensure that ISPs do have to be more proactive in dealing with alleged instances of copyright infringement on their internet service. And so a question for us to consider in class is to what extent should the government make laws to place greater responsibility on internet service providers to act when it comes to infringing material taking place on its network. The final issue in relation to infringement is that of direct infringement, which deals with imports for the purposes of trade without the license of the copyright owner, as well as um, copies being sold, hired out, or otherwise made the subject of trade, unlikely to arise in the media law context. The fourth step, then, is that of defences. So we've looked at subsistence, ownership, and then infringement, and now we're looking at defences. So as we've already seen, there is this balancing act, and that in copyright law there is this need to achieve a balance of interests between encouraging and providing incentives to those who create innovative materials on the one hand, and the interests of users of copyright materials on the other hand, in being able to access materials embodying original ideas or information. And so, in many ways, this balance is achieved through these defences or exemptions. There are three main sets of statutory defences. There are the fair dealing exemptions or defences, the statutory licences and then specific royalty-free exceptions. We'll be looking at this context because we've already dealt with statutory licences at fair dealing and specific royalty-free exceptions. First of all, fair dealing. These fair dealing provisions mark out areas of free use of copyright materials in the public interest and provide a complete defence to an infringement action. These fair dealing provisions are commonly referred to as exceptions, but are more accurately conceptualised as establishing limits to the scope of the bundle of exclusive rights. These fair dealing provisions apply to all categories of works and subject matter and to each of the exclusive rights, but are confined to the doing of acts for five specific purposes. These fair dealing provisions also permit royalty free use of a substantial part or the whole of the work or the subject matter without the authorization of the copyright owner. Now, a fair dealing with a part three work or adaptation or a part four audiovisual item does not infringe if done for one or more of the following purposes. A fair dealing for the purpose of research or study, for the purposes of criticism or review, for the purposes of reporting the news, for the purposes of judicial proceedings or the giving of professional legal advice, and then for the purposes of parody or satire. The first one is a fair dealing for the purpose of research or study. Now, research or study are not defined. Instead, they are giving their dictionary meaning. So research means a diligent and systematic inquiry or investigation into a subject in order to discover facts or principles. So in De Garris and Neville Jeffress Piddler Proprietary Limited, the respondent, a press clipping and media research bureau who supplied photocopies of published material in return for a fee, was not research or study uh, for the, this purpose. Now, in determining whether a dealing is for the purpose of research or study, the relevant purpose is that of the person making the dealing, not the purpose to which the reproduction or adaptation is ultimately put. So, in, again, De Garris and Neville Jeffress Piddle Proprietary Limited, the purpose of the respondent's press clipping service was not to conduct research. Its purpose was basically to make money, even though research may well have been the purpose of its customers. The next fair dealing is fair dealing for the purposes of criticism or review. This also requires that sufficient acknowledgement is made. And for, and for an acknowledgement to be sufficient, 
it must identify the work or audiovisual item by its title or other description as well as the author. Now, once again, criticism or review are not defined and are instead given the dictionary meaning. So criticism is used in the sense of the act or art of analysing and judging the quality of a literary or artistic work, the act of passing judgment as to the merits of something, and a critical comment, article or essay, a critique. Review is used in the sense of a critical article or report, as in a periodical, on some literary work, commonly some work of recent appearance, a critique. Now, criticism includes all kind of criticism. It is not restricted to literary criticism. Uh, and review is cognate with the word criticism. One is the process, the other is the result of the critical application of the mental faculties. Now, criticism and review are words of wide and indefinite scope, which should be interpreted liberally and extend to the thoughts underlying the expression of the copyright works or subject matter. Now, they involve the passing of judgment and may be strongly expressed, but provided they are genuine and not a pretense for some other purpose, they need not be balanced. Now, the test, as set out in the panel case at the full court of the federal court, was as follows. Is the program incorporating the infringing material a genuine piece of criticism or review, or is it something else, such as an attempt to dress up the infringement of another's copyright in the guise of criticism? and so profit unfairly from another's work. As Lord Denning said in Hubbard and Vosper, it is not fair dealing for a rival in the trade to take copyright material and use it for its own benefit. The next fair dealing is fair dealing for the purposes of reporting the news. So, copyright in a Part 3 work or adaptation or a Part 4 audiovisual item is not infringed if it is dealt with for the purpose of or associated with the reporting of news in a newspaper, magazine or periodical, provided sufficient acknowledgement is made of the work or audiovisual item, by means of an electronic communication or in a film. Now, it covers music incidentally recorded in the course of reporting news by means of broadcast or film, but will not extend to music added to the soundtrack, which does not form part of the news being reported. So, for example, if a journalist is outside a music concert and there's music in the background that is recorded, then that would be covered. If, however, the journalist wishes to add a particular song for effect to a story or a news report, then that would not be covered. Now, the fact that news coverage is interesting or may even be entertaining does not negate the fact that it is news, although the court acknowledges that it may sometimes be difficult to draw a distinction between news and entertainment. So in the panel case, the court concluded that news reported with humour may still fall within the ambit of the fair dealing provisions. That is to say, a show like the panel or the project could perhaps rely on the fair dealing for the purpose of reporting the news, even though it is not strictly or just a news program. The next fair dealing is fair dealing for judicial proceedings or the giving of professional legal advice. And then the final one is a fair dealing for the purpose of parody or satire. These are quite recent provisions that were added in the Copyright Act in 2006, and they apply where a person or organisation can demonstrate that their use of copyright material is a fair dealing for parody or satire. The Act does not define parody or satire, nor does it require sufficient acknowledgement of the work is to be made. Now, defences relating to parity can be found in other jurisdictions, including the United States and the European Union, but Australia's defence for satire uh, is broader than what we find in other countries and may well be unprecedented. There is, however, some strong justification behind protecting both parity or satire. There's a few different reasons as to why the government introduced this. Namely, criticism even or especially when done with humour, is necessary for public debate and discussion. The original author is unlikely to lose proceeds for a work of parody or satire, and copyright 
should not be used as a means of censorship. As to the likely scope of the new exception, we can perhaps have some reference to the fair use doctrine that we see in United States copyright law. It's worth noting the fair use doctrine because there have been some calls, including from the Australian Law Reform Commission, for Australia to adopt a broad fair use defence instead of these specific, more limited fair dealing exceptions. We'll look at some of these case studies if we have time in class. We also should mention some of these specific royalty-free exceptions that have been introduced, specifically time shifting, format shifting, and private copying of music. Now, the time shifting defence or exception became relevant in the case of National Rugby League Investments and Singtel Optus. This dealt with the Optus TV Now service. Now, the TV Now service that Optus introduced allowed subscribers to the service to record television programs and store the recordings for up to 30 days on remote Optus servers, which subscribers were later able to play back on their compatible mobile device or personal computer. Subscribers were able to basically watch the recordings near live, with a delay of as little as two minutes from the commitments of the actual free-to-air broadcast. Now, when subscribers selected a program to record using Optus's TV Now service, equipment owned and operated by Optus made four copies of the pro program in four different formats, allowing subscribers to view recordings on a range of devices, PCs, Apple devices, Android devices, and 3G devices. Now, Optus commenced these proceedings on the basis that or claiming rather that the NRL and AFL had made unjustified threats of copyright infringement against it in relation to its TV Now service. The NRL, the AFL and later Telstra, who was the exclusive licensee of the NRL and AFL broadcasts, cross-claimed, alleging copyright had infringed the copyright in the live NRL and AFL broadcasts. So there are a few different issues before the court. First of all, who made the recordings, and if it was held to have been Optus, did the Section 111 time-shifting exception reply? Now, at first instance in this case, Justice Rares found in favour of Optus, finding that it was the subscriber that was responsible for making the recordings when he or she clicked on the record button on their compatible device, as no copies would have been brought into existence unless the subscriber performed this action. In reaching this conclusion, his Honour considered that the TV Now service was substantially no different from a VCR or DVR. Because of that, um, the trial judge did not need to consider whether Section 111 uh, applied to Optus. Now, this was appealed to the full court of the federal court, um, and they reached uh, a different conclusion. So in relation to this first issue as to who made the recordings, was it the subscriber, Optus, or both of them jointly, the full court of the federal court found that Optus made the recordings. The court said that Optus was manifestly involved in the copying process, as it not only owned and operated the system which made the recordings, but it also solicited subscribers to the service. So the court considered Optus's role in making the broadcast to be so pervasive that despite the entire process being automated, Optus's role could not be disregarded when determining the question of who was the maker of the copy. So because the court considered that Optus made the copy, the question was then whether Section 111 of a time-shifting exception could apply to Optus. The court held that it could not apply to Optus at the time shifting exception applied to private and domestic use and encompassed recording broadcasts and watching recorded broadcasts inside and outside of a person's home. The court found that there was nothing though in the section or the language of section 111 to suggest that it was intended to cover commercial copying on behalf of individuals. Thus the court said that Optus made the recordings for a commercial purpose to make profit and that it could not rely on section 111. So this was a case that was important for the purposes, obviously, of Section 111, but it also has significant challenges for various cloud providers. 
uh, in relation to how the Copyright Act may apply to the cloud. And so again, if we get time, we'll talk about this issue in class. The fifth and final step then in relation to copyright problems is to look at remedies. And there are a range of civil remedies provided for in Part 5 of the Copyright Act, including injunctions, damages, additional damages, account of profits, conversion damages, and also ant and pillin orders. What we have also seen, though, in the last few years is the criminalisation of copyright law. And so we now have a number of indictable, summary, and strict liability offences relating to copyright piracy. That then brings us to the end of our discussion of copyright law. And one thing you should think about before the class is to what degree does the Copyright Act strike an appropriate balance between those competing interests? Also, consider what changes, if any, would you make to the Copyright Act.